or um, I'm going to watch this later. We have Dr. Fisher here today and he's going to be our presenter. So we'll, he'll present for probably about 45 minutes. We have two gentlemen here with us and we might have a few more come in. If they have questions, um, they'll try to speak as loud as possible so the microphone picks it up. I will also open up my laptop so if anybody comments online and has questions, I can also raise my hand and ask doc Dr. Fisher. So I'm going to read a little bio about him and then we'll get started. He has a presentation. If anyone wants me to email it to them afterwards, if you can't see it, um, I can do that. Or if anyone online wants me to email it to them, just comment in the, in the part below. Um, so Dr. Fisher or Damien received his doctor of pharmacy from Florida A&M University of College of Pharmacy. He prolonged his studies and completed a residency with an emphasis on community and ambulatory care at the University of Tennessee. He became intrigued in academia during his career and has held three clinical assistant professor positions at Hampton University School of Pharmacy and University of Houston College of Pharmacy as well as South University School of Pharmacy. His passion is in the ambulatory care world within the areas of pulmonary and dermatology. He is currently certified as an asthma educator and is heavily involved in the American Lung Association. He's actually come to these Better Breathers Clubs probably three, four, five times since I started back in 2017. And he is one of the favorite speakers. People always learn a lot, so I hope y'all um, learn a lot from him as well. Um, he is a board member of the National Association Certified Asthma Education Board, advocating for asthma educator opportunities. Damien currently works as a UTMB Health League City team as an ambulatory dermatology um, slash allergy clinical pharmacy specialist. Above all, Damien in his spare time is an advent or an advent movie goer. He watches all types of movies and he goes as far as critiquing them. So welcome. Um, we're also on YouTube Live, so we have a few other guests. If y'all have any questions, um, please raise your hand. We have a microphone over here, so just speak as loud as you can. If they if they don't hear you, it's okay. Um, so welcome, and let's give a warm round of applause for Dr. Fisher. Hi there, Dr. Lynn. Um, so I've done this uh, a couple times for the American Lung Association and the Better Breeders Club. I love doing this. Actually, uh, it brings me joy doing this. Uh, inhaler device trainings. Uh, also talking about COPD and uh, patients using nebulizers as well. Um, there are many devices on the market now. And some of them can actually can be a little confusing and also can have issues working them as well. So there uh, is the reason why we do this education is to make sure that you're able to use them and also make sure that you're able to get the best out of them as well. So there are, um, <clears throat> talk about a little about COPD, um, uh, just, to, just to talk about that as well as inhaler devices. Um, I, I, I don't know how many of you guys do have COPD, but the problem with COPD is not just an inflammatory condition, it's also a structural condition condition as well. Uh, you lose a lot of uh, alveoli, which are those exchange for oxygen to carbon dioxide. So when you breathe in, there's this big giant balloon that it increases, and then when you breathe out, it deflates and that releases your CO2. But in the case of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD, uh, those alveoli, alveoli sacs, they start to lose their elasticity. So when you breathe in, and then when you breathe in and when you breathe out, there's actually air trapping going on. So you can't get this full breath of air because there's already air in your body. So unfortunately with COPD, it gets worse over time. But there are um, some um, novel approaches that are coming out uh, in the next couple of years. Some of the biologics are, they're looking into treating COPD, at least uh, not, I wouldn't say, um, as a cure, but making sure you don't have any more progressive loss of lung function. Uh, those biologics are those injectable drugs that actually work on the signaling of inflammatory mediators as well as, uh, as, well as uh, 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 things like white blood cell counts and things, uh, things like that. So uh, the reason why we need to know about inhalers is because unfortunately, I mean, unfortunately, fortunately, that is the best way to treat COPD along with some um, of the uh, uh, breathing exercises and breathing treatment as well. Uh, so let's talk about some of them. Sorry, it's hard to do this without a clicker. That's, that's my fault. 
So the pretty much what runs the market now? Dry powder inhalers. Now, dry powder inhalers pretty much run the market, but the problem with dry powder inhalers and COPD patients is sometimes you may not have enough force to inhale that powder. You ever you ever cough or you ever have this bad taste in your mouth or you don't feel like the drug is actually working when you're using those dry powder inhalers. And so let's let's look at some of them. <clears throat> you have So these are examples of your dry powder inhalers. You have the twist inhaler. Anybody ever seen this? Okay. Anybody ever seen one that looks like Advil? It's like discus inhaler. Okay. And then you also have the elliptic device, Trilogy. Probably some of you guys seen Trilogy, a neural Elipta. Um, there's so many more, and I'm just losing my mind on them. But there's four or five different types of elliptic. These are your dry powder inhalers. Now think about it, it's a powder, right? So you have to have enough force to, to inhale a powder. If you don't have enough force to inhale a powder, it doesn't get best, it doesn't get that best lung deposition in your lungs to actually go to the site where it, whether your lungs expand or it gets rid of the inflammation depending on if you're on inhaled corticosteroid. So the dry powder inhalers pretty much run the market. The newest one on the market is Trellis. We can talk about that. We'll talk about that a little later. Uh, Advair, the discus one, is one that everyone pretty much remembers. Uh, this one's probably one of the first ones that actually hit the market. And the twist inhaler is probably somewhere in between. So <clears throat> there's always been um, uh, an idea that inhalers and nebulizers can treat these pulmonary conditions. Now, with nebulizers, uh, there's one good nebulizer on, on the market ultrasonic nebulizers, you'll see a lot more drugs that are available um, in nebulizer uh, solutions. Now, when I first graduated way, way, way long ago, uh, there was like only, you could only get your albuterol and your ipitropium bromide, atrovent, or comedone. Those are the only three you can get. Now, you, now you can get uh, a LAMA, a long acting drug uh, that actually works on a particular receptor in your lungs. Or you can get a long, another long acting drug called a lava. You ever hear these terms? Do doctors say llamas and lavas? How about like spiriva, cheotropium? Ever hear that? No, no cheotropium. I've heard of spiriva on the TV commercial. Oh, okay. Um, so spiriva is one of those long acting drugs that work on the receptor in the lungs to allow your lungs to expand. So instead of you being on like Cerevit or like Advair, which is a steroid and a lava, actually it takes away the steroid and just expands your lungs and it does it for anywhere between 12 to 18 hours of the day. So it's, it's really good, it's, it's better than just being on, um, sorry, an inhaled corticosteroid or a short acting drug. And no one wants to carry around their nebulizers all the time. Now, Getting to nebulizers, as you can see here, there has been a progression of when nebulizers first came out. They used to be as big as this 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 blue thing right here. When they first came out, this is how big nebulizers were. Okay? Now the nebulizers are getting a lot smaller, right? They're getting so small, there are also nebulizers you can fit in your purse in the pocket. The problem with it is it costs way too much. I think we're talking about anywhere between two to three grand and don't think your insurance is going to cover it because they're going to be like, you can just have one at home and use your inhalers while you're out. But they do work. Um, and and, and with, the, with the amount of drugs that are coming out to treat uh, COPD that are available in nebulized solutions, I think the insurance company is going to have to change the, change the way they uh, pay for certain things. Um, the MDI, which is this one, the meter dose inhaler, this was the, pretty much the first handheld inhaler to come out. I think all you guys remember this. This is albuterol, Pro-Air, Provencil, whatever you want to call it. But it came out as the uh, MDI. It used to be called a CFC uh, meter dose inhaler. But the reason why they got rid of the CFC because it, it, uh, it hurt the ozone layer. And also, it, also the CFC, their particles were big when it came out. So the CFC inhaler, when, when, the, when those uh, when those drugs came out, the particles were so big, they used to come out like this. And 
back in the day, they used to tell you to do the two finger width method because the particles would just hit the back of your throat. You would lose 70 to 80% of the drug. Now, we came out with the HFA, Provental HFA, Proair HFA, uh, Albuterol HFA. The particles are a lot smaller and you're not losing as much of the drug in the back of the throat if you use it properly. Why should we worry about picking and inhaling? Wh wh why is that important? Well, it's important for us to have better outcomes with our lungs. Um, it's important that we need to pick the right inhaler for the right patient. If we don't pick the right inhaler for the right patient, that, that shows poor outcomes, that shows poor hearing, they're not getting any better. Because subjectively, we can just, we just worry about how you're feeling once you leave the office. And we don't know how you're using the inhaler. If we don't know how you're using the hair appropriately, it doesn't mean the drug's not working. It could be the actual, we didn't teach you the way to use the inhaler appropriately. And then we move up to another drug, and then we move to another device, when we should have actually taught you how to use the first device. Does that make sense? So, and sometimes, and you're gonna hear me say this word a lot, the new hotness, the new drug out of the market, is not always the best drug for you, okay? There's been drugs that's been here since the 1960s, and guess what, they work just fine. There's been multiple studies on them, they come in multiple devices. Just because a new drug comes out with a new inhaler, does that mean that should be the drug for you? So don't force, don't act like someone should ever force upon a device or a new drug for you. Is that my voice that just echoed? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was like, what is that? Okay. Lastly, let's, all, let's be real. We also have to think about cost of therapy, okay? Now, I can tell you this. <clears throat> Keep going to my fun bag of tricks. When you have devices like this, the Respimac device, I don't know if you guys have ever seen this, this is a soft mist inhaler. It's a great device. It's a great device for COPD patients. It's also one of the, uh, it's about number two or number three, the most expensive device depending on what drug and also depending on your insurance. This device is called Todoza. It's another dry powder inhaler. This is, device is very expensive. Now, <clears throat> when you look at these devices as a whole, it's about what device fits you the best and also is it, which one is going to be most cost effective. There are plenty of drugs out there and plenty of devices. If they want you on one drug, more likely, you can get the same drug in the same category in another device. So don't, don't act like, I mean, not you act like, don't feel like you're forced to be picking on one drug and only one device. You don't have to. The device has to fit you. And the reason why I say that because if you don't have a great inspiratory flow rate, and all I'm talking about, that's a big fancy word for me saying inhaling. Okay, if you can't inhale with a great amount of force, maybe certain devices is not going to be the best for you. Because as I said, powder is harder to breathe in than mist or air particles. Does that make sense? Kind of, maybe, okay. <laughs> I keep going backwards, okay. So that brings me to the in-check guide. I use this device all the time in all my clinics when I have my asthma clinic. This is measures inspiratory flow rate. Has anyone ever seen this? It's not a peak flow meter, it's called an in-check guide. So what this is, <clears throat> it measures how, uh, how great your inspiratory flow rate is. And then it correlates it to a particular device. So if you can't breathe a certain number, certain devices are not gonna work for you. And then these symbols here around the dial correlates to a certain device. For example, this circle right here correlates to an HFA or that MDI here. Now see how big that hole is in the middle? So for me to inhale an HFA or the rest of that device, it's going to be a lot easier because this hole is so big. But if I wanted to do the handy inhaler, which is Fariva, anybody ever been on Fariva, the little handy inhaler? The uh, one where you have to press the button and it pierced the capsule? 
Look how small that hole is. That correlates to cerebral aneurysm. So think about it. You have to inhale so much force to get the drug out of this little hole. So you're going to have to you're going to have to have a lot of force to get it into your lung. Whereas if you went to the HFA, you don't need that much force to inhale the drug out of this hole. Does that make sense? So this in-check dial is something I like to use as a baseline. Okay, I, I mean every time this is subjective. The reason why I say it's subjective because it's based off the patient's effort, right? So one day they could be feeling fine, they use this, they're like, oh, I can breathe 100 milliliters per minute. Next day, they could have, the next day I just got off a cold and they could breathe 30 milliliters per minute. But it's something I like to go by in order to make sure they're, they're, they have the right device, okay? Every day is always going to be another challenge, especially when your lung function is going through an exacerbation or not going through exacerbation. I need to see where you're at as a, as a medium, pretty much. So I love using the in-check dial to basically give me that baseline of what the device is good for. Does that make sense? Um, now, you can actually buy these. Um, I actually like to use them for free. I use these mouthpieces and I switch them out between patients. Um, the reason, reason why I like to use them, again, it just gives me, all right, maybe we should stay away from this device and just focus on this device because that's what your body is telling you. Dr. Fisher? Yep. <clears throat> so do the doctors that they're seeing, their pulmonologists, use those or like do some type of test to know so they, they prescribe the patients the right medication? Yeah. So this is just a handheld, it only measures one thing, expiratory flow rate, right? But when you guys do spirometry, um, you ever go in for spirometry every three to four months or every six to 12 months where you breathe into a tube and they say, okay, blow up. And then they tell you to breathe back in. And everybody ever done that? Well, that's called spirometry. In spirometry, you can definitely measure your respiratory flow rate. The only thing about that is you're going into the doctor's office, you're spending a couple of hours there, you're getting that test done, and then they're giving you the results this is just more quick and easy, handheld. I can tell you what your inhaler device could be. Okay, that gives you a variety of different numbers. Your FEV1, your force expiratory volume in one second, your force vital capacity, that's what spirometry gives you. This just measures inspiratory flow rate. So this just helps me pick one thing out of your pulmonary health, which is your actual device. Whereas spirometry helps me with your overall treatment plan. Does that make sense? So if they did purchase one of those at home and use it, would they want to relay that information to their pulmonologist? I, yes, most definitely. Um, the only thing about it is, um, as I said, it's subjective, right? So just as much as them using the inhaler devices, it is subjective, it's based off the patient's effort, but it still gives you a trend. It still gives you some type of idea about what's going on with the patient. Like, you know, Monday through Friday, my inspiratory flow rate was 80. But Saturday and Sunday, my spiratory flow rate's 30. Well, why is that? Well, my kids come over with their cat. You know, you don't know, you know. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not saying that that's the truth. I'm just saying there's factors that can actually give you an idea about what's going on with your total lung function. And I'm not saying the in-check dial gives you that. The in-check dial just uh, gives you a better idea of what device is particularly better for that patient. And spirometry can do the same, but again, spirometry is not something you do Again, it's not something you're going to be doing um, uh, every 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 other week or every month. Uh, this is probably something you're going to do every three or four months, every six months, every twelve months. Um, and then check out something you can do on every follow-up visit. I like to follow up with a patient um, about one month after I see them, um, depending on their COPD and depending on if they're controlling or not. Good question. So as I said, the in-check dial measures your inhaler resistance. It also looks at your inspiratory flow rate. Um, particle size is a big thing. Um, so every device gives a either smaller or larger particle size. Dry powder inhalers, since they're a powder, bigger particle sizes. Soft mist inhalers, like this one, let's just look, take a look at it. Soft mist inhalers, smaller particle size. 
because it comes out of mist. The particles are really finite and small. Whereas if you have the discus inhalers, dry powder inhaler, when you press down on the lever and you inhale, it's a powder that's coming out of this little pouch. Particles are a lot bigger. Particle size matters in the point of when you're looking at lung deposition. Even though there's no clinical study that says better lung deposition improves better outcomes, theoretically speaking, you would want that drug to reach the, the bottom of your lungs as much as possible, theoretically. But one more time, there's no clinical study that says lung deposition of a drug improves better pulmonary outcomes. But as I said, I think inspiratory flow rate can definitely, uh, can definitely show us which inhalers are good for which patient along with educational uh, uh, intervention. There's numerous amount of inhalers. Has anybody ever, has ever, anybody ever seen one of these inhalers? Just tell me what color you've seen before. Which one? Top left, the handy inhaler. That's for real, right? So that's the one where you drop the capsule in, you pierce it, and then, and then you know, you're supposed to, you're supposed to uh, inhale as many times until that capsule rattles. That's when you know you got all the drug out of the capsule. Oh, I thought you were about to ask a question. My bad. Uh, so, the albuterol? Did they say anything about your diaphragm going up and down? Low white blood cell count. And uh, are you on a nebulizer as well? No, I just I got Spariva. So the Spariva is does it still come in the handy inhaler or does it come in the rest of them? The top left one. Oh, you don't use it? Okay. So you know Spariva can also come in the soft mist as well. So this might be a little easier for you. So and you know if you want to like after this we can measure your inspiratory flow rate, and, and, or I can do spirometry on you for free. I brought that as well, it's up to you. But um, yes, so the handy inhaler is definitely one of the forms Spreva comes in. Spreva also comes in the Respimat. You also have the turbo inhaler, the, which usually is more your steroids. Um, you have the Gin Air, which is your Tadoza, which is a llama, law-acting muscarinic antagonist. And then you have your Elliptid inhaler, which is more your dry powder inhalers as well. So these are your preventers. These are your drugs that prevent. Um, now, the, the one that looks like the HFA, albuterol comes in that. Now that wouldn't be your preventer, that would be more your rescue. So again, with the HFAs, remember it's amount of, since it is based off your uh, handheld, you want two fingers at the top, you want your thumb at the bottom. Now, do you want to shake it? Yes, you want to shake it. The reason why you want to shake it is you want to mix the propellant and the actual, actual drug together in order to make sure you get the correct dose. If you don't shake it, you could get more drug or you can get less propellant, therefore causing either a weird taste or causing other issues of not getting the drug, uh, not getting the drug into the lung but hitting in the back of the throat. So you want to make sure you shake it beforehand. Two fingers at top. I can do one finger at top because my fingers are so big. Thanks, Dad and Mom. So you want to use your thumb at the bottom. You also want to make sure you shake it. Breathe in, breathe out while you're shaking it. Put your mouth around the mouthpiece like so. And then when you press down on the canister, I want you to inhale, not uh, slow. I want you. I want you to. Uh, I'm sorry. Once you inhale fast and uh, rapid and deep breathe at, at the same time. So you're going to, so it's going to be real deep when you, uh, fast and deep when you inhale. And you want to hold your breath for 10 seconds, all right? And then how long do you want to wait between each inhalation? Does anyone know? Can I do this? Can I do this? Is this good? So, I, and, and I understand that, but your lung can only absorb so much at one time. So you're wasting that second dose. Not you're wasting, but people that do that are wasting that second dose. So you can only inhale one inhalation 
per minute. So once you do hold for 10 seconds, you have to wait one minute and now do that process again to do two inhalations. Does that make sense? <laughs> and I, and I, I get that because that's one of the misconceptions that you're like, oh, my lungs can take it, let's, let's, let's do it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> the problem with that is you, build up, you can build up a tolerance to albuterol. You really can. All right. So you want to make sure your lungs are able to get that full dose because you're just wasting that second dose. You paid hard money for this. Okay. So you don't want to waste any dosages. Okay. Also, there's a the thing with priming as well. So with the HFAs, you're always going to have to prime. Every drug has a different priming, um, different priming for um, for each device. I can tell you normally with the HFAs, if you don't use it in 30 days, you're going to have to shake it and spray it always towards the ground and uh, waste one or two puffs to make sure the device is working again. Or once you open it out of the box, open it out of the box, you don't want to always use the first dose to your mouth. You want to go ahead and prime either uh, two to four dosages to make sure, to make sure, well, not actually two to four, sorry, one or two dosages to make sure the device is work, working properly. If you don't, the device is not working properly, there will be nothing coming out of it. And then guess what? Send it back to the manufacturer, you get a free one. Or go to your local pharmacy and show them. They'll give you a free one. So does anybody ever use a spacer? Good. <laughs> you should. Uh, you can't. Sorry, not that you should. You can. Uh, I actually have uh, experience in the prison system, so when we use the spacers with toilet paper rolls, we didn't want them to uh, shank anybody. So we uh, actually told them to use toilet paper rolls. Now the thing about a spacer is the spacers can work. I think the best spacers for you are those static-free spacers. Now uh, I don't think I have one with me. Uh, but those static free spacers, the ones that where the particles are not actually settling at the bottom. So once you push, once you press down on the inhaler and the particles go into the spacer, the static free spacers allow the particles to go back and forth for some time until you're waiting to inhale it. Now, when I say some time, I do not mean 30 minutes, I do not mean an hour, I mean some time like maybe one or two minutes. Um, so uh, the, uh, if you don't get a static free one, you're going to have to use the inhaler and the spacer at the time of administration. Okay, so it, they can be a little bulky at times, so that's why sometimes it's not the best thing uh, for mature individuals. I don't like to call anyone older than what they are, I just call them mature. So as you can see here, the with the spacer is actually a, a little bit bulky to have, but it does work but those static free spacers are the best ones for you. So we already talked about using the inhaler. Um, oops, I'm going backwards, let's go forwards. Now, how do you clean your, your NDI? Does anybody ever clean it? No? You know? Oh, say so, so what? Yeah, you can wipe your mouth, mouth off with a, a damp rag, that's fine. Um, um, you, you don't have to use a dry tissue, but you can use a, uh, uh, like, just like a damp cloth. Um, how long, how, how many, how, uh, do you do it every week, every day, every? Back out every week, because I'm usually higher and I can't work, that's a Gotcha. So the reason why we clean those NDIs is to make sure there's nothing that gets clogged. Um, because there are particles going through this tiny hole right here, all right? And sometimes we can build up uh, excess amount of both dust, dirt, or the particles actually clean it to the side. Sometimes you get clogged. So I usually suggest people try to clean it every week. You never dump it in water. That used to be an old way to do things. You never submerge it in water. You take a damp rag or you can take a tissue, just wipe the outside of it. Uh, <clears throat> also, um, when you uh, um, when you're thinking about cleaning it, make sure you don't store it in a very humid place. Make sure you store it in a place where the room temperature stays pretty much the same. 
Now, each one of these uh, HFA inhalers holds about 200 inhalations. Now, um, you're going to get some that do hold about 180, but normally with our Buterol, Provental, ProAir, uh, they hold about 200 inhalations. Now, the great thing about us, we finally came together and said, you know what, it would be a good thing to have patients understand how many inhalations they have. I mean, who goes like, you know, I had two on Monday and one on Sunday. No, no one's going to actually remember that. So now some of these are actually come, getting a lot smarter and actually having the dose counter at the back or on the top. So for Simbacort, which is a steroid in a lava, a long acting beta 2 agonist, as you can see here, it has the dose counter at the top. Yes, sir. Proair, Provental, Albuterol, all one and the same. It's just a different company trying to get, a, get some more money. You, you see yours, man? That's great, that's great, that's great. Um, so, there's also something called the auto inhaler. Now, I can tell you with the auto inhalers, the great thing about the auto inhalers are you don't have to press down on top of the canister, but they're still called a dry powder inhaler. So, auto inhaler is just activated when you put your mouth to the mouthpiece and you inhale deeply. Now, since it's an auto inhaler, do you think you have to inhale fast or slow? It, so it's a dry powder inhale, so you have to have, inhale real fast, <clears throat> real quick, right? So the great thing about it is there's no handheld coordination like a HFA, right? Because with the HFA, you have to press down on the canister and inhale as soon as you press down on the canister. With the auto inhaler, there's no pressing. It just comes like this. There's no button at the top. You put your mouth to it, and you inhale fast and deep, okay? With the HFAs, you inhale more of a slow pace because it's a uh, HFA. So the auto inhalers have no dexterity. Um, the, there, there are dose counters now. Um, Q-Bar, um, what is Q-Bar's called? Q-Bar is a steroid, and there's a particular type of auto inhaler that is called, is, is escaping me right now. Um, I keep going backwards. And then you also have the turbo inhaler, which is the twist inhaler. Right? Um, you also have the turbo inhaler with your twist inhaler. So most of these inhalers are basically um, uh, steroids. Now, when should a COPD patient be on steroids? Has anybody ever told you that? Has anyone ever checked your eosinophil count? You ever get blood drawn? You do? You get like drawn every three to six months, every 12 months, once a year. Well, you get it twice a week for another reason. Yeah. So, in order for a person, according to the gold guidelines and according to national guidelines, uh, for you to be the to get the best out of inhaled corticosteroid, there's something they look for called eosinophils. Eosinophils is just a fancy way of saying that your body has inflammation going on. That's all it's saying, right? If it has inflammation going on, what's the best way to treat? With well, a steroid, of course, right? It's in your lungs, right? So if your eosinophils are high, steroids are appropriate. Now the twist inhaler, most of the twist inhalers and turbo, turbo inhalers, they come in steroids. So the way this works is, you see there's a dose counter right there. Put your mouth to it and you inhale slower fast. 
to dry power. Fast, yes, you inhale. You inhale fast and deep. Hold your breath for 10 seconds. Guess what? Put the top back on and you're ready for the next dose. Because when the next dose, you take it off again, that next dose gets loaded and it drops down to 106. So you got two now? Oh, no. No, I just inhale. No, when I do, I just inhale one. Oh. That was 107. Oh. Now we're on 106. I didn't do that. Oh, well, I didn't. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I went through the motions too quick. I'm sorry. But what I was trying to say is that the dose gets loaded in the, in, in the cartridge and it's waiting for you. Now, let's just say you, know, like, you have a busy day. You wake up in the morning, you got your grandkids, your kids, you know, cook your breakfast, cook your breakfast. You, you take the dose off and the dose is what? It's just chilling. Then you get pulled in another direction and you come back and you're like, did I take my dose? Don't worry, it'll be there for you next time. You put it back on there, that dose is lost. It's a rotating little pendulum that goes like this. Once that, pen, once that rotating pendulum has moved on, no matter if you inhale it or didn't inhale it, it is lost. Does that make sense? So just, because they want you to let down. <laughs> no, I can't say that. So I, I don't know why they made it like that, I guess. But the thing about it is, yes, I would want to say that. They don't want you to double dose. Because they, there's no point of you taking too much steroid. There's not. There's a certain point where the steroids are only going to work so much. So doubling the dose doesn't make it work better at certain at certain doses. Does that make sense? So Pomacort again, another steroid. It's a uh, budesonide. The great thing about these also have negative. They, these have negative feedback mechanisms. Again, another fancy word marketers use. It allows you to know if you're inhaling the drug correctly. So, if I'm inhaling it too, uh, too slow, it makes a whistle sound. And then it tells you, hey, you ain't getting the dose right. And guess what? It will make you put, the, put uh, the device back down and you have to inhale it faster again. So, there's also some, if you, um, there's also other devices, if you inhale too fast, it will tell you that you're inhaling too fast by making another sound as well. So these negative feedback mechanisms are just supposed to help the patient out to let you know you're getting the dose incorrect. Make sense? Of course, with any DPI, you never want to submerge the device because it's a powder and you could also affect. So when you're cleaning the devices, you never want to submerge the, the device in water. With the devices that are DPI, you know, normally want to wipe, wipe around the mouthpiece. Um, you still hold your breath for 10 seconds, just like a regular inhaler. And again, you wait one minute between each inhalation. One minute, because your lungs can only absorb so much at one time. The discus inhaler, Advir, Cerevant, okay? So the discus inhaler, the great, the thing I want you to always remember, hold it like a horizontal sandwich. Or like I told in prison, you hold it, I'm gonna hold it like a cucumber sandwich. I'm like, when's the last time you had a cucumber sandwich in prison? What the heck? But anyway, the point is, you wanna always wanna hold it like, hold it horizontal. Don't hold it vertical, because you have to think again, it is a disc with little dosages at the end of the disc, right? So if I load this, and I go like this, the dose is gonna be, the dose, prob, the probability is that that dose will be lost. Great thing, the thing you need to understand about discus, hold it like a disc, hold it like horizontal, hold it like a sandwich. So with the discus inhaler, again, it's a dry powder, so we're gonna inhale it fast, yeah, fast. Now, with the discus inhaler, they do have this little small dose counter for you, which is, which is really ridiculous, okay? See how small that thing is? Yeah, see, there you go. You can't see it, right? So you want to make sure you hold it horizontal. Um, and when you open it up, I always tell patients use two hands. Use your thumb to open it up so the mouthpiece is shown. Once the mouthpiece is shown, you, now you have a couple things. You have this lever, and you also have the mouthpiece, right? So with the mouthpiece, when you're cleaning, always clean. There's a, there could be a white residue, and that's the stairway accumulated. You always want to wipe it off. Um, I usually tell patients about every week, make sure you wipe it with a, not a damp cloth, just wipe it with a cloth. 
okay, never submerging the water. How do you load the dose? You can load the dose by pressing down the lever. That dose is loaded now. Should I do this? Should I do this? Should I shake dry powder inhalers? What do you think? No, I should never shake dry powder inhaler. That dose could be lost, right? But once I load that dose, now it's ready for me to inhale. Breathe in, breathe out, away from it. Do I want to breathe into it? If I breathe into it, I could displace the powder. So no, I don't want to breathe into it. So you want to hold it like a sandwich, breathe in, breathe out, away from it, put your mouth to it, inhale fast and deep, hold your breath for 10 seconds, and normally with dry powder inhalers, it's usually one inhalation uh, twice a day, uh, depending on, uh, sorry, normally with the discus ad gear, it's usually one inhalation twice a day, but uh, depending on what, what, what drug you're using. Then you close it back up, horizontal, and put it away. Okay? Dry powder inhalers, never shake. One thing you take away from here, dry powder inhalers, you never shake. So the great thing about dry pot inhalers, they do have a dose counter, even small, but you also want to make sure you inhale it quick and deep, quick and deep with dry powder inhalers. The Elliptic device, I love the Elliptic device, but it is a dry powder inhaler. The great thing about the Elliptic device, you see how big that dose counter is? See how big that sucker is? Sorry, I should call it It's really big. Maybe I have another one. Hold on. So uh, with this one, it usually has uh, 30. So it has one that comes up once a month, right? So that's how big the dose counter is supposed to be. Now, it's only on 30. Now, the thing about a little device that you have to be concerned about is basically once this mouthpiece cover drops down, you hear that click. Let's try it one more time. See if everybody can hear me. That click, that dose is ready. It's ready to go. Should I do this? All right, can I do this? No, shouldn't, shouldn't do that, right? All right, so now that dose is ready. Now you can see it's dropped down, the number has dropped down. I tell my patients, hold it like a sandwich, breathe in, breathe out, away from it. Now, the thing that everyone forgets, and even me sometimes when I'm educating patients and I always get reminded by my students or residents, never cover your finger over the vents while you're inhaling. Never cover your finger over the vents while you're inhaling. Why do you say that, Dr. Fisher? Well, the reason why is if I try to inhale this with my fingers off, when my fingers covering the vents, I'm not going to get the full drug. It's the disbursement between the air outside and the air inside for me to get the whole drug in. If I cover it, I'm not going to get the full dose of the drug. So you tell a person to hold it like a sandwich, fingers are not covering the vents, uh, breathe in, breathe out, away from it. What I'm going to bring faster, uh, faster, slow. It's a dry powder. Fast. So I'll breathe in fast, hold it, hold my breath in, hold it, and uh, breathe in fast and deep, hold my breath in uh, for 10 seconds, close it. Once it's closed, it's ready to go for the next steps. Now, in the prison system, we had a problem with this. They, for those patients uh, that uh, once they came in and they didn't have any um, close friends, they, uh, their, their roommate would do this. <laughs> so when I'm doing this, what happens? I'm wasting all the doses, right? I can't get those doses back, okay? So we always, we, that's what we had a problem with. We had to make sure that patients didn't actually take hold of these and we had them make them come to the clinic uh, inside the prison. I thought, it's not hilarious, it's not funny, it's just one of those things of prison life that you have to worry about. Yeah. Oh, what's up? When they're out of those, you give them to the place. Yeah, pretty much, they're like, hey, wanna hear Cookie Town? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, and then you also have the hand inhalers, the dry powder inhalers. Um, th those are coming out of style, those hand inhalers. The reason why is because it takes a lot of force to inhale all that drug out of that capsule. You have to breathe hard, okay? So the thing about it, you're trying to inhale all that, all that powder out of that capsule. You might have to do it three, four, five, six times to inhale all that powder. So 
they're coming out of style because now there are more devices that are easier to breathe in. Finally, let's talk about the soft mist inhaler. I love this device. Um, and I'm just not, not saying that. It's really good for my COPD patients. But unfortunately, it does cause a little bit of force to load the device. So this is your device. It's a soft mist inhaler called a Respimax. Chiotropium comes in it. Your llamas, your lavas come in it. Combavent, which is a short-acting uh, uh, albuterol, as well as ipratropium bromide, comes in this. The great thing about this device is, is that the particles are small and it's very easy to breathe in. Unfortunately with that, it also takes a lot of turning to load the dose. So you want to keep the cap on like so, and you want to load the dose. So I want to load the dose, I turn it counterclockwise, right? And there's an arrow to show you. It takes a lot of force to do that. Now, there's an arrow to show you to turn it counterclockwise, right there. So when I tell patients that dose is loaded, I want them to now flip it like a sandwich. When they flip it like a sandwich, I tell them to take the cap off. Now, the great, the thing why I tell them to take the cap off at that time is if the cap is off already, I could press down on a button and I lose the dose. The dose is gone. Now there is a dose counter. That dose counter is really not finite. It is a, basically a range of dosages and it just shows you a lever right next to it. So you don't really know if it's 80, 81 doses left. You just don't know, okay? So you want to make sure you tell the patient, hold it vertically, turn the bottom. Actually, you know what? I think I have enough for everyone to try. If you already have one, um, I'm sorry. Go ahead and try to turn the bottom to the fourth page and turn the bottom. Go ahead and try to turn it. You think it took a lot of force? Yeah. It, took some, it takes a lot of force, right? So just remember that. So when you, take, when you do turn it and you load the dose, Hold it like a sandwich, take the cap off, breathe in, breathe out away from it, and now you want to press down on a canister. But the thing about it is, you don't want your lips to go over the slits. You want your lips to go right above the slits, press down on the canister, and the drug comes out. What's wrong? Something? Pharmacists are supposed to load this for you the first time. So it actually comes in two separate parts. It comes in this canister, and you get this whole entire part here. And they have to shrug up, basically push the canister into the needle of this device and load it for you, and then put the sleeve back on it. Okay? So it comes in two separate devices. So I just want to let you know that. Okay? So, um, yes. So there's no generic form per se, but they may be expensive, but there's a lot of rebate programs and patient assistance programs not based off income. So um, if, you're, if your insurance covers travel views, more than likely, I'm pretty sure your insurance will cover a drug off, off of rest of the policy. Oh, that's nice. don't private insurance and the oh. <laughs> I'm, pretty, I'm pretty sure you won't have a problem. But uh, these soft mist inhalers are really good uh, for inhalation. Also, there's also breathing exercises that people do uh, to control your breathing. Have you guys ever done personal breathing? Personal? Huh? Here. Here? Okay. Does that work for you? I always, yeah, that, I, that's why I tell my patients to do personal breathing to them help with their breathing as well. Um, but with these devices, I want to let you know. How am I doing? Oh, you're good. Okay. 
Um, I want to let you know with these devices, there we have to fit a device for you. All right, there's so many devices out there, and there's so many drugs. All right, since we have the, all these options now, because 20 years ago we did. 20 years ago, you're going to get aspirin, you're going to get albuterol, you may get freeze. I don't know. That's it. But now we have so many drugs, so many devices, and now we can fit a device that fits you and fits your lifestyle. I mean, the same thing with a nebulizer. Nebulizers are now getting so small that you can put them in your pocket, uh, put it in your purse. So now we can fit it to your lifestyle. Not just say, this is what you got, these are your drugs, and we can't help you after that. All right? We have to educate you more, and that's the whole point of, of this presentation, is to make sure you understand that you have options, and if you ever need an education on them, I am free. I love doing this stuff. This stuff brings me joy. Um, if you have any questions, concerns, please don't hesitate to ask right now. Um, I also will be staying here to do, if you want to do a spirometry or in check dial for free, I don't have a problem doing that as well. Do you all like the whole set of Oh, what's that, sir? Do you all like the crown Actually, I'm down a lot. I'm at UCMD in League City oh, okay. and uh, dermatology. Actually, I'm working in dermatology, allergy, and pulmonary. So uh, I help with education there, also getting their patients medicines and trying to make sure that they're able to have access to care. UCMD? Yep, down the street by uh, the League City campus. 646. Yeah. Six, no. Six, no, um, Golf Freeway uh, 2240. Where's that? The hospital. Yeah, right next to the hospital there are, there's a, uh, Next door, there's something called like Shoe Carnival, uh, J uh, JC Penny, and then there's two big giant oh, outpatient. Yeah, I'm in the outpatient center. Oh, okay. Yep. That's where we go. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So you can make a U-turn. Oh, okay. And go back up to the yeah. shopping mall. Yeah. So you pass the you pass the hospital on your left. You take that next exit, and then you make a U-turn, and then. I'm on the right, you see a Starbucks, you see a Best Buy, I'm right, I'm right there. So if you ever wanted to come by, I am free to mayor Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 5. I, I love doing education. You know, Are you going to give us one of your cards? Sure, I'll give you one of my cards. Oh my God, yes. <laughs> I, I, I think I have one, I think. If not, I will. Uh, I, just, I have your name on that. Do you have my, uh, do you have, uh, am I, I able to? I can email it out or post it. Please, please do so. Uh -huh. All right. All right. Any questions, concerns? Does this go too fast? Did I make it fun? Okay. About the choices. Yes, ma'am. Can you explain? I just first went to a first two inhalers that are more prominent and have worked better for patients are your lavas and lavas. And what I'm saying that is just saying drugs like Fariva, saying drugs like Cerebrin, saying drugs like, um, uh, it's crazy, um, what we'll call long hair. Okay, give me that. Uh, see, he didn't know if I had COPD or not. He didn't know. He got the liver Okay, do you have a sinus?
questions for Dr. Fisher or myself about pulmonary rehab or any of our therapists, um, you can email me at tyler at bchouston.com and I can get you in contact with Dr. Fisher who just presented or I can get you in contact with one of our clinical directors about pulmonary rehab or portable oxygen. I, I handle that and I can answer a few questions as well. So thank you all for tuning in.